We'll get started in just a few minutes. Uh, if you're looking for Ecotopia 2050, you're in the right place. Um, we'll give folks a couple more minutes to arrive. Once again, welcome everybody. <clears throat> Folks are still arriving, so we'll just give them a couple more minutes before we get started. Welcome to you newcomers. Um, we're just holding out a couple, maybe one more minute. We'll let people arrive and, and then we'll get started. I think we should go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to Ecotopia 2050. I'm very uh, excited to host you all tonight. My name is Martin Bork. I'm the executive director of the Ecology Center. And uh, it's so great to see so many friends and members and colleagues and associates on, on the uh, webinar tonight or the, in this dialogue tonight. Um, couple quick things, um, you know, we'd like you to, sit back, relax, engage, um, you know, take, uh, make sure to turn off your cell phones, the bathrooms are in the back, uh, check your exits, just kidding. Um, we're on Zoom, so I imagine most of you know uh, how to use Zoom and, and that, but we're, um, it's the first time we're doing a webinar on Zoom, we've been using a different platform. So uh, I wanna thank uh, Erica Everett and Denea Shorter, our tech team tonight um, for hopefully making this um, smooth. And um, we will be using the Q&A button 
uh, for the question and answer period later, but feel free to put questions in at any point. Um, and um, we'll have some time for, for Q&A towards the end. Um, also the chat is open if you feel like chatting with each other, um, feel free to, to do that. Uh, if you're having technical difficulties, Danae is kind of monitoring the chat. So, um, um, you know, if you, she might be able to help you out if you're running into some difficulty. Um, so Ecotopia 2050, what is it? Why are we here? Um, when I was uh, a young activist coming up, um, I came across Ecotopia in a uh, college class at UC San Diego. It was about um, uh, humans and the environment. It was called Human Values and the Environment, I think was the, the name of the class. And um, it's an amazing book that, that really struck me and stuck with me and had a large impact on me and a lot of people um, around me. Uh, it was written in 1975 by a Berkeley author, Ernest Kallenbach. And um, what he did so well was to really capture the values and the ideas and the um, future vision of the movements, the social movements that were happening at the time, particularly environmental movement, but lots of others, and put them into this um, contract, context uh, that was cast uh, into the future. And um, you know, the premise of the book was that um, radical eco-feminists in the late 1980s um, managed to secede from the United States and take Northern California, Oregon, and Washington uh, to an independent nation called Ecotopia. And 20 years after that, um, and, and they completely separated from the US, and 20 years after that, um, a reporter is allowed to come in. And the book is his first person experience of this radically transformed society. And as the Ecology Center approaches or is celebrating its 50th anniversary, um, we really wanted something where we could look back at, you know, when was the Ecology Center founded? What are the values it was founded on? What have we done both as an organization and collectively as a movement over, or movements over the last 50 years? And what is this time right now calling on us uh, to, to think about and vision for the future. And so there's an exercise in here that is really about, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And um, right now with all the smoke, both politically and literally, it's hard to see the future. So we wanted to um, really press into a little visioning as well of like, what's it really gonna take um, to get to the, the vision that we would have if we were writing Ecotopia today and creating a future um, society uh, based on the values that, that we hold on to. Um, you know, when the Ecology Center was founded in 1970, it was coming on the heels of um, racial rebellion in this country, riots in the street, assassinations of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, um, John F. Kennedy, uh, the Stonewall uh, riot and protests that followed. Um, you know, uh, the women's movement was taking off. I like to say the Ecology Center was conceived in the summer of love and born on Earth Day. Um, we were actually got our 501c3 nonprofit status from the IRS on Earth Day 1970. Um, and it, the Ecology Center was founded in um, creating that first Earth Day movement. Um, so, um, the, um, so again, the book is uh, Ecotopia and the author, Ernest Kallenbach, uh, he lived here in Berkeley and he really was able to capture that whole kind of zeitgeist and, and put it down uh, in this book. And there are really many of the ideas, technologies, social values that the Ecology Center was founded on are represented in this book. And those are things that, that still very much guide us today in the book. Um, it's a car-free society. People uh, work a 20-hour work week and have um, basic uh, minimum wage, uh, minimum income uh, uh, guaranteed. There's universal health care. 
uh, the air and water are sacred and they're clean and safe. Um, the natural resources, the forests are revered. Um, education is very practical and hands-on and takes, on, takes, um, takes place in the natural environment to a large degree. Workplaces are largely run by the employees, a lot of worker owner cooperatives and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it really pulls together a lot of different elements um, and um, was very inspirational for, for a generation of us. Um, tonight, we get to discuss this, this book and, and other things with um, a young person who has really stepped into a leadership role in the last two years. Um, Hannah Estrada is a youth climate justice organizer with um, Youth Versus Apocalypse. And um, she and other young people in light of the dire and um, very serious climate crisis projections um, and in light of the Green New Deal coming out, um, got, very, got super active and have made a significant difference already. And we look forward to the, the change that they're going to bring forward. Um, they boldly confronted Diane Feinstein and asked her to uh, sign on to the Green New Deal and we'll show a video clip of, of that. Um, you know, really young people speaking truth to power and demanding, um, you know, a future for them and for the rest of us. Um, and that, um, that video went viral, got over 10 million views. And uh, following that, they organized two very successful, massive youth uh, climate strikes. And um, We'll talk more about that and have done other protests, including protest uh, at Chevron and protesting the expansion of the Oakland port. Um, I really have a deep understanding of climate justice and environmental justice issues. And I'm so thrilled to um, welcome tonight, Hannah Estrada for a conversation about Ecotopia and our future. So welcome, Hannah. Hi. How are you doing? How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, um, Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. Can you just start us out with like, what is, you know, who are you? What is Youth versus Apocalypse? How'd you get started in it? So, I guess I, the best way to start is Youth versus Apocalypse is a youth led environmental justice group. Um, and we're based here in the Bay Area. And when I say that we're youth led, I really mean that we are youth led. Every single decision that we've made always comes directly from our youth, um, usually advised on how to like carry out those directions by adults or by allies. Um, and we focus primarily on environmental racism and the intersectionality of the issue that we're facing and really how the root of the issue is classism and racism and how we wouldn't be facing this crisis without these things. Um, me, myself, I got involved sophomore year, and I'm a senior now, so it's been a minute, um, and I was not a kid looking to organize. I was not a kid looking to be in this fight. I did not grow up really knowing what climate change was. Um, I wasn't involved in politics. It wasn't a very big thing in my family because some of my family members couldn't vote, so it wasn't something we discussed. Um, I don't ever remember seeing anything about it on the news. So I wasn't a kid that went out looking for it. I kind of just fell into it um, through like, I guess, friends of a friend. And what really got me started was the Green New Deal. Um, and even then I wasn't fully like organizing. It just kind of, it just kind of happened. So yeah, but Youth Versus Apocalypse is Bay Area youth and that's what we do. Thank you, thanks. Um, so, you know, the Green, the green New Deal, um, Tell us, you know, about it. What, what about it was um, awakening or inspiring for you? Yeah. So it was the first piece of legislation I've ever read, um, or I guess I had ever read. And I don't even remember. It wasn't something I wanted to read. It was someone had just asked me, like, "Hey, can you make a graphic for this? Here's the PDF, um, and can you make it by like Friday so we can pass it out and distribute it?" And I was like, "Okay, sure." And when I read it, I was like, "Whoa!" Like this actually seems like a really cool thing to be carried out. Um, and even though I wasn't super involved in 
politics or keeping up with what was really going on, I had the basic understanding of we live in a country that doesn't take too kindly to people of color and people with lower incomes. And I know that because obviously I came from a lower income and I came from a family with a lot of people of color. So I saw a lot of it myself and, and there was this understanding of this kind of like animosity with our government. So to see a piece of legislation that was really for me, it was the the focus on on people of color, on indigenous communities, on black and brown people, on people in the lower class, people in the working class. Like it was the inclusivity for me that really made me like, oh, like this is something that I'm willing to fight for. Like this is something I'm willing to get on a Zoom call for like four hours and talk about and work for. The greenhouse gas part, so the main thing was that it wanted to get greenhouse gas emissions down to like 0% by 2030. That I was still like, you know, I'm a sophomore. I'm not really sure exactly what that means. Um, so it wasn't that specifically that pulled me in, but I think maybe it was the combination of like, of just the inclusive inclusivity part. Um, but now that I'm a little bit older, I do understand how like vital that was to that piece of legislation. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, um, I've been doing, you know, climate related work from a very local perspective. You know, I've been at the Ecology Center now for 20 years um, and um, done other climate related work. I first heard about climate change um, about the same time I read Ecotopia in, in, in the late 1980s. Um, but it was always something that was, you know, out there in the next century and far away. Um, and the solutions were always these sort of big technological transformation of, you know, our the combustion engine to, you know, these giant solar farms that are far away. Um, you know, it didn't feel um, so personal or, or intimate. And I think, you know, the things that inspire me in the Green New Deal are one that it has a New Deal approach. It's a societal approach. It's not a technological approach per se. Mm -hmm and that it really focuses on how we get there um, in terms of not displacing people who have um, good paying jobs right now in fossil fuels, for example. You know, we need a just transition. We need to figure out a way forward that, that those people don't lose their jobs um, and can't feed their families. They've gotta be part of this new economy and it really focuses on this new economy and these new opportunities um, I think the boldness of it, you know, it really responded to a crisis. So for, for years, for me, the, the climate movement was um, very incremental. And we we're always trying to find like, what are the triple win? You know, where can we um, do something that will get us, you know, forward on our climate goals, but not hurt anybody too much. And, you know, that everyone will kind of say is okay and it won't cost too much money. You know what, it was in this envelope of what was possible in a certain, very constrained by lots of things. And the Green New Deal just said, look, this is a crisis. We gotta get rid of all that and think really big. And, um, and, and you know, that, that to me was what was so powerful for uh, uh, about it. And, and like you said, the inclusivity and really thinking about, um, you know, for the first time, Green New Deal said to me, um, wow, people of color are understanding how climate is going to screw them first and worst, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that is a, is a new frame to, to, you know, to really hit at a, at a national, and, and that is national, you know, it wasn't like some small city or the state of California, like this is a national bill. Mm -hmm. I think on terms of um, color pe people of color understand, I think the sad part and the thing that YBA really tries to push is that for a lot of communities of color, like the climate crisis isn't something they're waiting on. It's already happened for them. Like if you take a look at West Oakland, like they are significantly impacted by the pollution over there and they have been for years. If you take a look in San Francisco in the Bayview, like there are people that died from those shipping plants. Like there are people that died from those ships like just from that pollution. And so it's, it's, it's hard because it's, how do we make sure that when we're organizing and we're doing these things and we're talking about that, that we remember like, we're scared of something that's to come, but a lot of people who have been fighting are already going through it, are already seeing it and have been seeing it for years before 
probably I was even born. Well, I think, you know, that what, what's been amazing about um, Youth versus Apocalypse is, I, to me, and inspiring is your courage. And um, when you guys, you know, that came across so powerfully when you confronted Diane Feinstein, I, we'd like to show that clip now. Um, Erica, if you can cue that up, um, you know, it's just, uh, you know, very clear. You guys had a, a very clear ask of her and, you know, her response uh, you know, was, um, I don't know, I don't want to give, you know, let people take their own opinion. We'll talk about her response afterwards, maybe. But um, I just thought, you know, to, to take, you know, very clear and straightforward and simple demand to her and just say, this is what we as a new generation need. Like, what got you guys to that point of, um, uh, you know, confronting her or bringing that demand to her? Um, I think it was her putting out her own version of it. And you have to remember, originally the group was, it was not a lot of kids, it was maybe like 10 to 15. And a lot of them were really young. And for this specific video, we were there with Earth Guardians, which they're, they're very young. They're like 11, 10, 9, 8, some of them are like seven years old. And it was us, you know, reading the Green New Deal and being like, this is, a, this is solid for us. Like, we would love to see this happen. This would be great. And then reading her version and seeing how much was like left out. It was as if she went through the the actual Green New Deal and just took a Sharpie and was just like, Z -Z 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 -Z. and it was so disappointing. And also kind of like, like just like an off brand version of the Green New Deal. And it, it made a lot of our young people very anxious and very upset because it for us, it's, you know, it is our future as well for us already not living in it. And so, I think there was a mixture of, you know, anxiety and anger and just wanting something that would be solid for us, wanting something that would really come through and show results that would kind of save this like impending doom that we always have in the back of our heads. Let me just check and see how's that video coming. I know it takes a minute to load. Um, so, you know, what was it like confronting her? Like what? So that day, I actually was not there. Okay. I was not there. I had been involved with the Green New Deal, but I think I had like two tests. And this was like my first ever time really being involved. So I was not one of those kids who was like about to miss school to go do whatever. I was just kind of like, I got tests and I'm not trying to get in trouble. So I'm just going to go. It wasn't until after I realized, because I feel like for me, the Green New Deal was a part of my education on what was going on. Before the Green New Deal, I really felt like I was just walking around with like shades over my eyes because I didn't understand. I wasn't involved in it. I didn't understand and I didn't really have a want to because I didn't understand how serious it was and how it was already affecting people and going to affect more people. So for me, it was after that happened, um, one of our like main adult supporters like pulled me aside and was like, hey, um, this video is kind of blowing up. I don't know if you have Twitter and I didn't. So I didn't know what was going on. Um, we're going to go back like on Monday and we'd like it if you would come because, you know, we think you have some important stuff to say. And I also, you know, like support and we need people. So I was like, OK, like I'll go. And from there, it kind of I'm not sure what it was. It might have been the energy of the other young people around me and how serious they were about it and how serious like these young, like younger kids than me were about it. That really pushed me to understand the situation more. Um, I think that was it, was probably like the energy of the people around me made me want to like, okay, this is something I wanna do. Great. Erica, do we have the video? Do we have the clip? All right, let's run the clip. Here it comes. We are trying to ask you to vote yes on the Green New Deal. Okay, I'll tell you what. We have our own Green New Deal. Some scientists have said that we have 12 years to turn this around. Well, it's not going to get turned around in 10 years. What we can do Senator, is just put doesn't get ourselves turned around in 10 years. You're looking at the faces of the people who are going to be yeah, living with you. Yes, the government and is supposed to be for the people and by the people. And all you know what's people. interesting about this group is I've been doing this for 30 years. 
I know what I'm doing. You come in here and you say it has to be my way or the highway. I don't respond to that. I've gotten elected. I just ran. I was elected by almost a million vote plurality. And I know what I'm doing. So, you know, maybe people should listen a little bit. I yeah, hear what you're true. saying, but we're the people who voted you. You're supposed to listen to us. That's your, How old your are you job. How old I'm are 16. You? I well, can't you didn't vote. vote for me. Well, she, I'm she voted. Voted. It doesn't matter. We're the ones going to be impacted. It doesn't matter. We're going to be the ones who are impacted. Wow. Um, okay. So what did you, I mean, what was your reaction to that? At first, when I watched it, it was very cringy to see. It was very, like, you could feel the tension through the screen. Um, and now when I think about it, it just kind of makes me like, wow, like, that is actually, you know, the stance of a lot of the people working in our government, which is, I understand they have a very difficult job and they have to be realistic about that job if they want to do what they do. But at the same time, um, you know, that whole remark of, well, you didn't vote for me, kind of was like, well, dang, like, does that mean that, you know, all these policies don't affect me and I don't have to ab oblige by them too? Is that what that means if I didn't vote for you? So it was kind of a little disappointing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I found it very condescending and, you know, disrespectful to people for who, who are very concerned about their future <laughs> and rightly so. Um, so, you know, I, I think it demonstrates to me why we all have to really amp up our game so much. Um, um, you know, what, what does that speak to you in terms of like the importance of young people being involved in activism and, and the political work of today? Well, I think there's that obvious part of young people are literally going to be the most affected by the climate crisis, the impending doom, whatever you want to call it, um, they're they're going to face it the hardest. And it sucks because, like she said, like, we can't vote about these policies. I have no choice but to live here, you know what I mean? Like, I have no choice but to, to be, like, raised around this pollution. And, like, it's, you know, it sucks because it's kind of like we know where we're headed and we know we have to get out of it. And all the young people are sitting here like, hey, can you can you clean up a little bit? And a lot of older people are like, no, like deal with it. Um, you can't vote, deal with it. So it's it's important because obviously, you know, we're going to be affected by it. But I think it's also important because, you know, it's giving young people like a purpose, but it's also giving a lot of young people a lot of skills. A lot of young people are learning what it means to stand up, learning what it means to like read legislation and be involved in politics and what it means to help our government be a better government and help our nation be a better nation. And so I think it's also cool because we get to work with like multi-generational. We get to work with a lot of people of a lot of ages and we all get to come together and there's a lot of different ideas that come about. And I think also something really interesting is young people Oh, can you turn up? Sorry, I read the comments. I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Um, I think young people, they kind of just, they don't have those same boxes, I think, that a lot of older people have today. Like, we will throw an idea out and we'll just run with it. And people might be like, that's kind of weird or like, that doesn't really seem appropriate or possible. And we'll just go and we'll do it anyways. And sometimes that's a bad thing. But a lot of times it really works for events. Like, at one of YVA things, a little thing we did to help boost morale is we played like really Bay Area music when people were coming in to the courtyard or the space that we were settling in. And it was cool because we had just marched like a mile. Everyone was tired and thirsty, but then you just saw all these young people just like dancing and getting ready to listen to speakers. And it was a very uniting moment. And it was like, who would have thought that like, we're gonna play this loud, like fun club music just to like bring the energy back in from that yeah. march so it was a very fun day but yeah i think that's you know youth are important and I don't well know i think i think you guys have been very impactful personally you know um the the urgency of the issue has certainly been amped up with you know recent reports and, and news and more findings and just our own experience of it you know it's very clear things are happening much more quickly and much more intensely than than previously projected and um 
making noise about it gets a lot of attention and it gets things moving and it opens room for new public policy and for uh, other things. So, you know, I, I think it's shaken things up. The, the climate strikes that you organized were um, uh, amazing and turned out a lot of people and, and um, really applied some pressure. And even if, you know, the, the immediate demand is something that can't immediately be addressed, it, it's, you know, a whole bunch following that a whole bunch of cities adopted climate emergency um, resolutions. I was saying, you know, it's no longer about, oh, climate's changing. And it's no longer about, oh, you know, there's global warming. It's like, no, there's a crisis and it's an emergency. Like mm -hmm. that turned up the, the heat a lot and opened the door for things like, um, you know, in Berkeley, we have this ballot measure, measure HH, Climate Equity Action Fund. And, uh, you know, that, I don't think that would have really been possible in the last election cycles. We wouldn't have tried to, to put that ballot measure um, forward to the voters but after the intensity, and it's, you know, of course, not just you and Youth Versus Apocalypse, but it's like all of these different actions that have come together mm -hmm. um, locally, nationally, internationally, that are really changing the urgency and opening opportunities, you know, and stack that on top of, you know, <laughs> the fires and the smoke and the heat and, you know, the intensity of that and how that, you know, is stacked upon historic racism and um, health disparities and disparities in education and housing and transportation and policing. You know, it, you start to see how wide those gaps get when you throw on top of that some of these really intense climate impacts. So I just want to, you know, as a person on the planet, thank you and the work um, that you and your colleagues are doing. And I really appreciate the infusion of energy and your focus and your intensity. Um, let's talk about Ecotopia. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so you've had a chance to look at, at this book, um, you know, it's from generations past. Um, you know, what, what were your impressions? What did you think? What, what do you think about it? At first, to be completely honest, this is gonna sound a little bit crazy. When I was reading it, I was like, this seems very culty to me. And I had to take a moment and be like, okay, does it seem culty to me because it was written like that? Or does it seem culty to me because the things that they do in this book seem so abnormal to me as, as someone who lives in America, like so outrageous that we would just never do those things, especially because something I really saw emphasized in this book was like unity and the collective and being around people and like sharing with people and opening your lives up. And I didn't realize how like isolated we could be in our decisions and almost selfish we could be when we're thinking about these decisions until I really started reading this book. So that was probably my first thing was like, whoa, like it almost felt like not normal to mm -hmm. like see this person who came from our culture be in a completely different culture that was in all honesty, like probably a lot nicer. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like a shock almost. Mm -hmm. Were there any um, specific, you know, so there was a lot in the book around the human interaction mm -hmm. and how the society plays out at the interpersonal level. And were there any particular instances that come to mind of like things that struck you as like, wow, that was different, <laughs> how that went down? There were a few, there were a few scenes um, as the, the main character puts it that were like overly emotional or just like outwardly like emotional and and these were scenes that were like the first one of the first scenes was um the protagonist is going to buy a train ticket he's already in Utopia, and he's going to buy a train ticket and the train train person train ticket seller i don't i don't know the word um was basically like you have to talk to me like a human being or i'm not gonna sell you a ticket and the protagonist was like that's crazy like why would you, you know, it was so funny because it was like, well, actually that makes a lot of sense that, you know, he wouldn't want to sell you something if you don't talk to him decently. And the protagonist was just like, that is outrageous that you wouldn't sell me something because I treat you like crap, you know? So that was funny. And I think something else I noticed um, was that the protagonist in the beginning of the book is kind of like mean, you know, he's not a likable person. And throughout the book, you kind of see him like soften up. Like the more he stays there, the more he, like in the beginning of the book, he talks about how his kids wanted to come with him and how he felt like 
um, I think it was his lover, his wife, put like this idea into their heads that he wasn't there enough. And then he was like, that's ridiculous. I have to talk to her. And then later in the book, we see him go, dang, I kind of neglect them. Like, I'm kind of away too much. Like, I kind of want to be with my kids right now. And I think that's really interesting that we kind of see that switch and him just being in a society that their whole thing is like people and we love people and like the social, like what's good for the majority and like what's good for our planet. And he kind of like just made that switch mentally without even really thinking about it. Yeah, there's a lot of personal transformation for him in the book. And he goes through a personal crisis at the end that to me kind of represented the societal crisis that we would have to go through to, to create a society like that, perhaps. Um, some of the things that are written in the book have actually happened, you know, like um, in the book, it's like this radical idea that there might be recycling bins and compost bins everywhere. And, you know, mm. that's pretty taken for granted, <laughs> at least in the Bay Area. Um, but one of the things that struck me was um, Market Street. San Francisco, one of the opening scenes in the book, he arrives in San Francisco, which is the capital of Utopia, and uh, Market Street has been completely closed to cars, and it just is pedestrians and bikes, and it's trees and uh, public transit, and um, people are moving about at a very leisurely pace. They don't seem particularly urgent about getting places, whereas, you know, as you know, on Market Street, you can get trampled um, if you stop walking at the wrong time. Um, they just did that in San Francisco. I mean, not, not that exactly, but it's now closed to through traffic and, and personal cars. And of course, in Ecotopia, it's a car-free society. What are your thoughts about, about that and closing Market Street and um, a car-free city? Like what would San Francisco be like for you without a car? It's so interesting to me because I think one, it's one of those, I grew up here, you know? So for me, it's one of those things I'm gonna be like, man, I remember we could drive down Market Street. <laughs> so I think that's cool. But also it's hopefully, you know, it means that not only our city, but other cities will make, you know, public transportation more affordable, more available and better overall. Because if you've been on SF public transportation, you know that, man, it could be it could be weird and it could be rough sometimes. And it could, there's a lot of odors um, and a lot of things happen on those buses. But I, I think it was so interesting to see like, Market Street went from being like super full, a lot of cars all the time where you could literally like, a lot of times you could see like the smoke from the cars to just being like empty and like clear and kind of a little bit calm, like a little bit peaceful Quiet. with cars. And I think it'd be really interesting to see, to really see like Market Street, what we have it now go to be what it looks like in the book, which in my head, I envisioned it as just like, big fluffy like gardeny oasis with people just kind of strolling through like it's a festival and like chilling but i think you know san francisco we already have too many cars so i think it'd be great if we could just get rid of them <laughs> but yeah cool well i i think um we want to have some time here for q a from the audience um i don't know i haven't seen uh, a lot of questions posted yet but if people have questions use that question and answer uh, box there. Um, thanks for the comment, Lucy. Um, if folks have a, a question, please uh, feel free to, to put it in there. Um, I see a question about HR 763. I'm actually not up to speed on that. I don't know if you are. Hana. I don't think I no. am. Casey Belmove, it places a fee on fossil fuels. All honesty, I think unless, oh, so just in case no one can, other people can't read um, the chat. Uh, Akila, I'm not sure if I butchered that ask, would y'all show support for HR 763 in case you don't know of it, it places a fee on fossil fuels used by industries. Uh, the money collected is distributed equally, I believe. To all American people, what do you think, Martin? You can go first. Um, yeah, I think taxing fossil fuels is a good idea. It's a little bit what we're trying to do with this measure HH locally. You know, personally, I think the cap and trade approach. You know, I'm glad we have it in California and it's generating a lot of revenue. But to me, like permitting more pollute, permitting pollution, mm -hmm. is, you know. Um, 
I don't know. I, I feel much more comfortable with like a straight tax and, um, and, and a cap, <laughs> you know, like, no, you can't pollute more or buy credits. You just have to stop it. Um, so um, yeah. And then, you know, distributing the money, I'm, you know, I don't really feel like taxing fuels and then giving it back to people is necessarily the way to go. I would be much more in support of like, let's tax the fuels and then pay for this tran just transition. Yeah. let's put it into the infrastructure that we're going to need you know because our um our sewage facility for example east bay mud is at sea level it could very well be underwater that's going to be a real problem um our freeway is going to be underwater in various places several times a year you know we have a lot of infrastructure in the bay area that's going to be flooded out so um the smoke and the smoke and the heat impacts for um people you know i, I would like to see that money go into um, either change or into um, mitigation and, and supporting communities that are hit first and worst. Yeah, I agree. I think, well, honestly, it just kind of sounds like, oh, they're going to tax them and then whatever this fossil fuel company is doing with them, they're just going to raise the prices and that'll pay for the tax. So it kind of just seems, I think maybe it was a good idea, it has good intentions, but I think definitely we need to be you know, we don't have a lot of time. So we have to be a little bit more like, I'm putting my fist down. We need more than this. Mm -hmm. um, There's a question about slowing down. Um, what do you think about the idea of slowing down in Ecotopia? I mean, one of the two real stress relievers are you've got a guaranteed income. You know, no matter what you do, you work, you don't work. There's a baseline for you. There is a safety net for you. And that can support artists and activists and people who want to take a year off and do whatever, or if you just can't work and you need, you know, basic needs taken care of, so there's no homelessness. Um, and there's a 20 hour work week expectation. So that just gives you so much more time to be relaxed and not totally stressed out and freaked out. The flip side is that everybody's not wrapped up about trying to get a whole bunch of money so they can buy that next consumer thing. Like they're not wrapped up on this consumer treadmill. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what are your thoughts about that slowness? It sounds, it sounds amazing, especially as someone I grew up, I grew up in the city. So everything is fast here and you're always on the go. You're always doing something. Even our versions of like of rest, a lot of times are are going out into the middle of the city and doing more things. And so you kind of, it's hard to escape it, especially, you know, young people culture out here is like being gaudy and getting the next new like Louis, um, Gucci, like expensive shoes, like a lot of consumerism things. And so I think the idea of it is really cool. I think it's, it's hard though. It's hard to fight like that that is such a, a big part in our culture and in our society, especially in San Francisco with people who were here and then new people like gentrifiers that are coming in. It's a part of theirs too. But I think it sounds like, it sounds like a dream. It sounds like a lifelong vacation and it, it really sounds like how life should be lived. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, finding ways to slow down and, and um, reducing our expectations material expectations mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of work out there now around gross domestic gross domestic happiness instead of gross domestic product and fulfillment as opposed to achievement or acquirement mm -hmm. you know um does much stuff make you happy i think you know having your needs met and having a roof over your head and food on the table and clothing and be, you know health insurance and you know being taken having your basics taken care of. Yeah. That's a real motivator. That'll make you happy to have that. But like then like chasing all this other stuff, pretty clear that doesn't make people any happier. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we focus on the human interactions on, you know, loving each other and caring for each other and supporting each other and being in relationship and mm -hmm. creating beauty and music and art and, um, I mean I think obviously it would start with people, you know, like people are going to have to adopt that. But I think honestly, when I think about it, like, why is it that we do want a lot of these things? Um, like the fact is, is that a lot, most people in America are struggling. We're struggling hard. A lot of people are trying to figure out how to get these basic necessities. And so, you know, it does feel good when you put on something nice that you saved up for that was expensive. Like it's, it's hard because it's like, how can we even really think about 
or at least for me, how can I really even think about how do we change this social dynamic of how we exchange mm-hmm. with each other when there are so many people who who don't even think, can't even think about that because there is no social life for them because they work like five in the morning to six p.m. at night, go home, make food, and they knock out. Like do it like, again. We have room for that. So I'm not quite sure exactly how to like overturn a society's entire morals, but I think for me, just it always starts with okay, like let's give them the basic stuff first, and then maybe when they're a little bit happier and life's a little bit better, maybe people will start treating each other better and talking to each other better. So. Oh, decolonizing minds. Sorry, I saw the comment, and yes, I agree, one hundred percent. Land back. <laughs> so, um, Hannah, um, you know, this is a utopian book, and there haven't been a lot of utopian models out there. There's been lots of dystopia um, created. You know, for my generation, there were plenty, but since the, you know the '90s, really, there's just been a constant stream of of real dystopian. Um, visions put forward. What are your thoughts about, you know, Ecotopia and Utopia versus sort of some of these other books and series? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that last part? I was reading the, the question. <laughs> I was just talking, you know, thinking about the utopian versus dystopian futures that, you know, what we see so much of today is um, the Hunger Games and Divergent and um, was the Maze Race blanking on the name of that and you know for my generation it was um, 1984 and a clockwork orange and a boy and his dog and the road warrior Um, but we seem to have no shortage of dystopian visions Hmm. what do you think about you know here we are with a utopian book I've I read one thing once on social media that was like people wonder why our generation is so ready to fight for it and so bold and and then they're like, well, we read books like The Hunger Games where she did not care and she was ready to lay down her life to get some type of freedom. So I think that's something funny just to know. Um, but I also think we're kind of, it feels a lot of the time like we're headed towards, like we're already living in a dystopia. Like maybe for, to be quite frank, for like the white um, good income American, this was a utopia. But now it's kind of, I think, hard for a lot of, white people to look in the media and see all these brown and black people getting killed, see them being oppressed and having to face it. And then us getting getting more and more bold and, and showing up to their neighborhoods and being like, hey, like vote this and vote that. And like, look at this, you can't gentrify here. It's not cool. And it's getting harder and harder for them to be like, this is a utopia. It's, I think people of color through social media are really taking advantage and, and being like, hey, like this was a utopia for y'all, but it was always a dystopia for us. It was never a utopia for indigenous people. It was never a utopia for Latin people, for black people. It was never a utopia. Like it's always been a dystopia. I think finally though, white people are kind of seeing how it is for them with the climate crisis, it will be a dystopia regardless of, of who you are. That's like, climate crisis does not see if you're black if you're brown Um, I think the root causes of it do but I think that's yeah we're we're already living in a dystopia and it's kind of whack so yeah well said well said and and utopian for whom right yeah yeah great so um looking forward to the future you know if we were if you and I were teamed up to write ecotopia 2050 um, and we were envisioning a new country. What are some of the elements in that that you, what would you want to include in, in your vision for 2050? Maybe a really big focus on, on indigenous leadership and black and brown leadership and really focusing on, we kind of see it a little bit in the book when they mentioned indigenous people and um, how they interacted with the natural world, but maybe really focusing and acknowledging like the suffering of black and brown people living in slavery mm-hmm. and really focusing on their well being and their voice in this and making sure that they always have a seat at the table. I think really focusing, that's my whole thing is like, is making sure like, like, cause it's, it's such an intersectional issue. And it's, I think I have to get even more fired up about it because I see so many people look straight past the issue 
of brown and black people being so heavily affected by this and go straight into like being green and like doing things that like a lot of people can't be green a lot of people can't change their whole lifestyle like you can that's a privilege to change your lifestyle like that and acknowledging like the whole system is set up kind of for the failure of black brown indigenous people and focusing on on really like their well-being and how if we didn't have racism and classism we wouldn't have such a fat climate issue so that would be my focus what about you um you know i one of the things I when thinking a little bit about that, I was like, wow, what if Northern California, Oregon, Washington split from the US? And then I think, well, you know, we're actually not that unified here in Northern California or in Oregon or Washington to have the, the unity and the clarity and the consistency. Like there's a high degree of buy-in in ecotopia into these values and there's you know everybody's on board with it and they sort of self-enforce a lot of norms and i just feel like right now i can't imagine i think for me the the unity is the thing mm -hmm. and it ties in directly to what you're talking about in terms of people having a voice people being at the table people having basic needs met um having self-determination in various important ways in their lives um but really, you know, bringing people back together and finding our humanity and our common values and, um, you know, the divisions that we have right now are so deep and so extreme and, and, and it's really hard to picture a pathway forward where they come together. But I think for me in Ecotopia 2050, that would be a real central, you know, societal and cultural thing you know, the, the, the stuff that, that sort of ties to our climate and our environment, I feel like that's stuff we know how to do it. Like there's so much on the table, you know, and, and there's so many great projects already, you know, Project Drawdown, for example, a hundred things we could do right now. You just put the money and the resource and the political will behind them would we'll make a huge difference. And, and we don't do that because of our division. Um, so I feel like, yes, all of that, we don't need cars and we need to have basic needs met and you know, all of these things, but um, how, you know, how, do we, how do we come together? How do we find the unity? Um, you know, how, how do we uh, get the toxicity out of our society? You know? and, and it's, you know, it's there from the beginning, obviously, you know, a country built on on genocide and slavery. Um, it's in our, you know, collective um, DNA for anybody who, you know, who has been raised in this country, it's, it's culturally embedded. And um, whether you're on one side of that racially or another, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's part of the mix and it harms everybody. Yeah. Um, some much more than others, but um, those are, I, I think, you know, those are the things that, that come to mind for me. Okay. Well, um, we got about five minutes left. I want to tell people about the next, um, you know, the, the remainder of the series, but I just wanted to say, you know, I'd give you an opportunity. Is there anything else you wanted to hit on or talk about or say or pitch or pipe or pump right now? Shout out to mom and dad or anybody. Or <laughs> Shout out to family. Hi, mom. Um, <laughs> one if you want to keep up with you know the work that we do uh youth versus apocalypse you could just google us um if you want to follow me my ad is estrada.hannah on instagram but um i also really want to say that i think sometimes when we like or for me at least when i started coming to events and seeing different organizers and activists it kind of sometimes feels like you're not involved in the movement um but like just you coming to, to something like this and thinking about it and then even taking a small action after of like donating or voting or like signing a petition those things are important like the little things are important so let's not skip them let's do the little things and then you know when you're there do the big things and i really have to emphasize that like you don't have to be a big spokesperson to really do something in this field like, don't have to be a giant organizer doing every single little thing because the truth is is that when you are organizing 
it's not just you. It's a team of people and a lot of ideas going around. And so just the reminder of like, you don't have to be some big environmental all the time person, but like, remember, like, it has to be a collective thing. It has to be a collective like issue. And it has to be, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but like, you know, the power comes from the majority. Like the power comes from when we're all together, like, like you said, like doing things as a group. So really focusing on like, so you, your individual being there showing up, like that is a part of that. So yeah, I don't know if that made sense the way I wanted it to, but I think it did, so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So true, so true. So um, we have some great speakers coming up in this series. Um, next up is Michael Pollan. Um, a lot of folks will know who he is. He's a local Berkeley guy, author of many books, including um, The Omnivore's Dilemma and um, most re recently, uh, some books on psychoactive drugs and mental health. And um, I'm really excited to have him to talk about food systems where he has really um, done a lot of, um, he's a journalist and he's a professor at, the, at UC Berkeley in the School of Journalism. And he's just done a lot of work on the food system. So there's a whole section in Ecotopia around stable state food systems. And you know, we run the farmer's markets we do a lot of food and farming related work and food access work. So I'm really interested to hear his thoughts about Ecotopia and um, our future and the future of food. Um, after that, we have Obi Kaufman. Obi Kaufman's also a local author, artist, um, uh, public speaker. Um, he did the California, the Atlas of California, California Atlas. Um, I'll get it right, but he's putting out a new book, um, An Atlas of California Forests, which is very timely considering what's going on with California's forests. And in Ecotopia, there is a real central theme around wood and um, respect for the forest, almost a, a religious um, appreciation for the forest. Um, and just, you know, I think digging into our natural resources, our wild lands, our open space, fire, um, with him will be really interesting and exciting. Um, after that, we have Aya de Leon. Um, I went to high school with Aya. She is an amazing author. She um, writes these um, um, amazing heist series of books is what she's most currently famous for, perhaps also a professor at UC Berkeley in creative writing um, and a poet and, um, you know, um, really has a good bead on um, climate. Her last book, um, Side Chick Nation, is about uh, some sex workers pulling a heist on um, people who are trying to take advantage of Puerto Rico after the hurricane and um, Hurricane Maria and, you know, so climate impacts there, very central to that book. Um, great read, uh, real page turner, pretty racy if you're interested. Um, and then uh, we finish out the series, and I'm really looking forward to talking with her about, um, you know, how Ecotopia deals with race, in particular, Black nationalism of the time, um, around women's leadership, um, uh, and, um, you know, this country is run by women primarily, and there's a female president in Ecotopia. So, you know, I think those will be some interesting themes to touch on, as long as, along with many others that interpersonal and relationship stuff I think will be really interesting. And then we wrap up with um, Annie Leonard, who is the executive director of Greenpeace and the founder and creator of the story of stuff. Many of you may have seen her video that went, um, it was kind of the first big environmental viral video about stuff, where it's made, what happens with it, consumerism, toxics, the, the impact of big corporations. And I'm really excited to um, talk with her about consumerism and um, waste and um, corporate control and um, you know what's going on with plastics right now. Um, Greenpeace is being a big leader on that lately as well. Um, so you know with all those um, amazing authors, uh, we hope everyone will uh, go get tickets and join us for those uh, events as well. Um, easy to find them on our website um, at ecologycenter.org and um, we hope everyone will will take some time out and um, you know your your ticket purchases really help us out this year is a financially very tough year next year 
is probably going to be even tougher for the Ecology Center. So your financial support is, is really appreciated. Um, in closing, I just want to say um, thanks to our technical team, Erica and Danea, for making this possible. I also want to thank, there's a whole um, number of other people in the organization. Um, Hannah, thank you so much for taking time to be with us and, and prepping for this and reading the book. It was very generous uh, of you to give us your time. We look forward to working with you more in the future um, in whatever shape that, that might take. I want to thank um, everyone who showed up tonight for making time for this in your, in your schedule and making some headspace for it. It's a tough time right now. So um, be good to yourselves and be good to each other. And uh, I want to thank those of you who are members and donors. I see a number of, of really familiar names on, on the list here. So thank you all for your ongoing support. My mom is on the call, so I want to give a shout out to mom. Thanks for all your love and care and support. Do hope you're well. And um, with that, unless I'm forgetting something important, Erica, Denea, nobody's pinging me. So I think I've covered everything. So um, thanks again, everyone. And thank you, Hannah, and good night. <laughs>